am really excited today, and all my students know I've been talking about this all year, because I've been trying to get <coughs> this particular glass artist here for several years now, and <coughs> finally we were able to mesh things together. And Sally Prash is both a scientific glass blower and a, a, an artist. The reason we've had difficulty getting things together is because she works all the time. She is at um, Syracuse University and at UMass Amherst, and when she's not doing those two jobs, she's traveling around the world, teaching people, talking about glass in um, Sweden or Japan or Italy, and uh, you can find her work in New York in the in the. Um, Museum of Design, you can find it at the Corning Museum, and today she's come to talk to us about glass and she's also going to be up in the glass studio doing some flame work and, and maybe letting a couple people have their uh, uh, try at uh, blowing a little glass and, and playing with it and uh, answering questions and demonstrating glass uh, blowing. So. Without any further ado, here I will have Sally come up and tell you her story. Okay, I, I want to um, thank you for um, bringing me here. This is a fabulous school. You guys are so lucky to be here. Um, I'm going to have two presentations. The first presentation is just going to be a, an overview of glass, and the second presentation is going to be a little bit about my story. And then if we have time, we'll open up for questions. Um, so I have some slides. Most of them are from the Corning Museum of Glass. And if you get a chance, you should go out there. It's about five hour drive from here. Um, and it has a huge amount of glass in the glass history um, they are presented. So this is a piece of glass. It doesn't look like glass, but it is glass. And if you notice the date on that, um, so glass has been made for many, many, many years, and it has come in many forms. Um, we'll go through this. So um, I put the date at the bottom, and you can look at these are little vessels that held um, precious oil. So back in these times, glass was considered more precious than gold, because it was very difficult to make at that point. Oops. <laughs> Um, this is a, what we call a marini. Um, it's a cane. It's a long, long piece of glass that's cut, sliced up. And throughout that whole, you know, long cane is the design on the inside that somebody created. So if you take half of this marini and flip it over to the other side, you have the other half, and that's what they did. Does that make sense? Yeah. So this is an oil lamp. They would. Um, this is how they would, you know, light a very nice um, palace or something. Um, this was hand carved. This, so somebody sat there and carved that netting around. So it used to be a big chunk of quartz, and then somebody carved it with rocks um, into this form. These are um, molded pieces of glass. And this is just, I just thought that was so elegant. You could see people making images like this today, but look at the date on that. So we've been making glass in this images of glass for a long time. So glass sometimes can get very decadent. And so um, I, we were at breakfast talking about glass chairs. Here's a glass table with a punch bowl on top. And this is very small. This is only an inch high. And thousands of these were made. Little images of, of what was happening. Um, these are Geisler tubes. They predate the light bulb, but they light up. So I often wonder about that light bulb, who invented it. Um, um, they're made out of uh, soft glass, and they're filled with different gases. Um, also, they used uranium glass, the one on the far end there, that kind of orange-green glass is uranium glass that lights up. We also have the Crookes tube, so this kind of starts the x-ray tube. And if you think about it, you know, think of our, 
our, how we use glass in a, the medical field. You know, where would we be without x-ray? Um, then I, you know, here's uh, metal and glass together. I think that's a very beautiful combination. So all these things so far you could see at the Corning Museum of Glass. Casting glass, using cast glass in stained glass panels. So that's a, another cast piece on the right. And on the left is, um, you know, just some images behind glass. Here's another glass chair that was cast. And when I say cast, they take, they have a, a form that they pour the glass into, and then they break the form away and they, their creation is there. Here's some um, glass heads, they're, they're life-size heads in different shapes. This is a large stained glass window that used to be at the Corning Museum of Glass. They've taken it down um, and we've done this area, but that's very beautiful. And cutting glass and grinding glass um, has been very important in the glass industry. You can get all different shapes and values. And painting on glass. If you've ever been in, you know, cathedrals or churches, you see a lot of painting on glass. Here, Kenneth Leap has put a big rabbit in the middle of that. So what they do is they paint the glass and then they put it into a furnace and fire it on. Here, Donald Lipsky is using scientific apparatus and creating artistic work with it. Um, he's sealed these carrots up inside of here and they've been in there for like, I don't know, 30 years and they look the same. Here's some more stained glass. This is little pieces of glass fused together. So you can stand underneath this, it's huge. Um, and then also think about neon glass. Think of all the neon signs that you've seen. Here a sculpture has some neon on snow. So glass can be very small and very large. And you can create big walls with it. Lino um, was the first Italian master coming from the island of Murano to share the secrets of glass. Um, the Italians put their glass masters for many, many years on the island to keep it a secret and you know to keep the fires um, out, out in Murano. Um, when Lino came to America and had a class in glass blowing, when he went back, he was shunned. Nobody would talk to him because he shared their secrets. And it did really change the, the glass movement in America, him coming over. Um, that has kind of calmed down a little bit, but there are still people in Murano that will not talk with him. And then glass fashion. Um, I'm part of the Glass Art Society and every five years we have a glass fashion show where we all dress up with different glass outfits and it's a lot of fun. But you know, think of all the jewelry that you see that's made out of glass, bangles, earrings, you know, necklaces. Um, and here we have a whole glass outfit. You can put things inside of things. Here, <laughs> Did I say I have something funny? Um, <laughs> um, so here, somebody has just taken um, um, bottles and put them in into you know the water and put a little weight on the bottom of them to make a design. So you could take something simple as simple as a bottle and make sculpture with it. Here's glass hanging above the ceiling and. Uh, it's a little scary because it's all sharp. <laughs> now glass has also been used for science and for um, the health industry. Here is a person making glass eyeballs. Um, nowadays there you have a lot of plastic eyeballs but still glass eyeballs are, are preferred. 
Um, so here's some scientific apparatus on the right side. Those are condensers. Whenever you see glass, something inside of something, somebody has made that by hand. So your beakers and your test tubes and graduated cylinders, those are made by a machine. But whenever you see something inside of something, that is made by a person by hand. And on the, on the left side, you see some tubing. And that's what we start out with to make um, scientific apparatus. So here's some images of different scientific things. Um, in the middle, you see a glass to metal seal. You can attach glass to anything. You can attach it to ceramics. You can attach it to metal. Um, you can go from different glasses to different glasses as long as you have the right glasses in between. Um, a lot of optical glass you see on the right side. You know, you think of your microscopes, you know, your telescopes, all the things that we use in science um, with that type of glass. On the right side is um, how we make your computer chips. So they have to, these wafers, we call them wafers, are held in a boat. And the boat is made out of quartz glass. And so somebody has to make that. Um, you could see the wafers inside of there. They're later chopped up into your little computer chips. And on the other side here, it's very big here, but those little, those things are about eight millimeters in diameter. Um, so it's pretty small. And there is a dime next to this. This is actually um, sapphire. You can actually melt sapphire into different shapes. And so here is just an image of a heart and the vascular system that a scientific glassblower made. We call these reactor vessels. So this is. Um, the Blaschkas, um, around 1850, two generations of, of people made these glass flowers for Harvard. And the flowers are identical to the flower itself. And this is the table that they used. Underneath the table, there's a bellow. And they would press that bellow to make air flow over a flame to make the flame hot. And um, they would make their creations that way. So another piece of glass that I think is kind of cool, this is Benjamin Franklin's glass harmonica. It's like um, the tops of wine goblets that are put on a spindle. And you wet your fingers, and you play it, and it gives you this beautiful sound. So I just put some images in here of scientific glass blowers working. Um, this group right here, they're making a big Klein bottle. A Klein bottle is uh, kind of like a Mobius strip. It has one surface. If you follow the edge of it, it just keeps looping around. So you can see how they did the setup there, and you can see the end result. Um, and one thing, I think scientific glassblowers have a lot of fun. He's having a lot of fun there. So. When you're a scientific glassblower, you get to work a lot with fire. It's a lot of, you know, heat. Um, and you get to create a lot of things. So here's some people creating things. A lot of times we use lathes, just like wood lathes or metal lathes, um, to help us move the glass around. You probably also notice that most of your scientific glass floors are men, but I'm trying to change that. Um, the piece on the upper left side, that's fused quartz. So a lot of your experiments have to be done in a very pure environment. And so that's what quartz gives you. It's a very high temperature glass. And this, um, this is the last slide of this presentation. Um, it shows the strain in glass. Upstairs, we talked about this just a little bit. When you work glass, you put strain into it. And we often put that into what we call an annealing oven to bake out the strain. We take it up to a certain temperature. All the molecules even out, and there's no strain. Sometimes you want strain in glass. Like your car windshields have tons of strain in them so that when it breaks, it breaks up into little pieces of glass. We do have a polariscope upstairs, and we could see this image upstairs if um, you come on up. OK, I think we're ready for the next presentation. OK, 
Okay, this next presentation, I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about how I got into glass and, and things that keep me going. Um, so in my studio, I have little sayings put around, little, little post-its and little things um, to keep me, I think, on, on cue. And this, this I really believe in, be truthful, gentle, and fearless. You know, if you just keep that in mind, if a problem comes up and you can just think about this and say, okay, how should I deal with that problem and move on? Because you will come into problems. Um, I started blowing glass in 1970 with Lloyd Moore. Um, and there's a picture of us together. Um, he was also a scientific glass blower that did artistic work. Um, we were blowing glass in Lincoln, Nebraska in the 1970s. And sometimes it was a little hard um, because I was a young white female with an older black man. And um, we had a we had to kind of overcome a lot of things like that. But a lot of his work dealt with the black-white issue in America. So he had scales with, with white on one side and black on the other that actually moved. Um, and so it was kind of cool. But there's some images of him. Here's another thing. Your value does not decrease based on someone's inability to see your worth. So if you make a piece of glass or a piece of art and somebody says, oh, I don't like that. well. Who cares, right? It's, it's in you. What you make is yours. Here's some pieces that I did in the 1970. These are furnace blown glass. So we don't have a furnace upstairs today, but we um, do have a torch. So I, I made things on the torch and then added them to the furnace um, glass blowing. If you go to Corning, you'll see some furnace glass blowing there. So. Um, here's um, some classes that I took, you know, that's me in the very bottom corner there. That's what I used to look like when I was 16. Um, but we were very, you know, in, at that time period, we didn't have classes like you have that are available. We just were starting out with like, oh, what is this glass? What's happening with this? You know, and trying different things. So this class I got to, the furnace wasn't even made. We didn't have anything. We had to make the furnaces. We had to put together to torches to work. Um, Pilchuck Glass School is up in the Seattle area. It's very influential um, to my work. I started taking classes there. There's Lino in the center in the 70s. Um, Finn Lingard, the Lubinskis were very um, important, and Cesare Tofello. So they bring um, master glass blowers from all over the world, and you can take classes with them there. And it's just a wonderful school. So. Um, the, these I call my glass mothers. They kind of coached me as I was younger. Um, Sylvia Vigiletti and Audrey Handler. Because there aren't that many women in glass, especially in the 70s, there weren't. But they just took me under their wing and, and helped me out. And just to let you know what women were looked at, at when they did glass in the 1970s, here's Audrey Handler and you could see all the men behind her going, oh, what can she do, you know? So hopefully that's changing. I see a lot more women in glass, and that's good. Um, I talked a little bit about scientific apparatus. Here's um, something that I'm well known for is making quartz apparatus. And um, we use actually quartz torches to, to make these things. OK, I'm just going to let you read this, because this is a little long. Um, but. I do work all the time. A lot of times I'm working seven days a week, six days a week. And if I didn't love and if I didn't enjoy what I did, that would just be horrible. So you got to find something that you love and that you enjoy that brings beautiful people into your life um, to have a really nice job. And so here are some of the people that I've worked with around the, around the world. I have been to Japan quite a few times, um, Italy, Ireland, uh, Sweden, Turkey. You know, glass took me there. I get these calls, you know, like from Japan saying, would you like to come teach in Japan? And I'm like, yes. You know, and then they pay you. And so it's really, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> 
And they also feed you really good food. So um, another school that's been very influ influential in my life is the Penland School of Crafts. It's in North Carolina, and they also have wonderful workshops there in all fields, including glass. So um, one thing I did for them last year, um, they have a big auction, and I made 50 horns and 50 rain sticks for them to auction off. And so here's some of the horns that I made for them. They made like $20,000 off of them, so that's good. Um, I also do work for other artists. So um, this is Jeffrey Schiff, and he's actually in Connecticut. Um, he, he doesn't know how to work glass, but he has these ideas of things that he wants to make. And so he draws them down, and then I create them for him. Um, and it's kind of nice working with other artists because it's things that I would never think about making. And you have to jump into that person's head and say, OK, this is, this is where we're going with this. It's a nice exhibit. Um, so some of, these are some of my works. I like light. I like how light goes through glass. So on the very right side, that's a neon cube that I did for a performer. And she's performing in that. And then some chandeliers on the top. And then some just neon glass down in the bottom left-hand corner. Um, the, the one closest to me um, represents how we jump from bubble to bubble. Right now you're in your school bubble and then later on you'll go into another bubble out into the world. And we just jump through and each, each one is very, you know, light, a lot of fun. Here's some um, chandeliers that I'm working on now. It's not a very good picture, but um, they're quartz glass and depending how thick or thin the quartz is, it gives off different brightnesses. Um, goblets have always been very important in the flame working world. So um, the one closest to me is, I call that the glass ceiling goblet. So as a woman, you're going to have a little harder time in every field. So there's a, a little woman trying to get above the glass ceiling, and hopefully it will, it will work. The center goblets bounce. The, um, you don't think of glass as being flexible, but it can be very flexible. So you can shoot champagne across the room with them. You can have them bounce off the table. Um, then we have a goblet in a goblet in a goblet. And then we have a rain stick goblet that sounds when you turn it. And so I like using glass and seeing the edge of glass and seeing how glass goes through, I mean light goes through glass. How are we doing on time? We're doing good. Okay. So um, the the one on the bottom there, I called that a shattered shell, and the edges are very sharp. You know, sometimes the rug gets pulled out from us, and we're just shattered. And we continue on in life, but that shattered shell will still be there, and the edges are still sharp. You know, as we go on. Um, and then on the very far right, that's a splash bowl. A lot of times I think glass and water are so very similar and so precious, both of them. And you can freeze the idea of water with glass. Um, these are some hot glass pieces, furnace blown pieces. So when we say furnace glass, there's a big furnace that has like 100 or 200 pounds of molten glass in it. And we go up and we, we dig it out with a, um, a pipe and shape and form it and blow into it. Um, so these are some items done like that. So uh, another thing that I really like, well, these are really bright. Um, is glass flowers. Um, if you ever get up to the um, Peabody Museum at the Harvard campus, you could see some of the glass flowers that I talked about a little earlier. Um, we do have um, what we call life forms, where flame workers from all around the world can you know, fabricate flowers that are exact replicas. And so these are some of the flowers I've, I've done for that exhibit. And this, I think, is the last slide. You can't connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect the, them looking backwards. So you have to trust that the dots somehow connect in your future. 
you have to trust. And a lot of these comments, I'll just find them and I say, boy, I really like that comment. I'm going to take that and stick it, you know, somewhere. And then I can just remind myself, well, if I'm feeling a little down, I'll look at this and say, well, in the future, everything's going to connect somehow. So I think we have a little time for questions, right? Maybe? Yeah. Okay. So, um, any questions? Back there? No questions? Ah, that's a good question. Was there a specific piece of glass that inspired me to go into glass blowing? And I'll have to say no. I kind of fell into this, and I never thought that this would be my job. But I've never found anything else better. <laughs> yeah, good question. Um, earlier we had a question, what's the largest piece of glass that you've worked on? Um, it was 11 feet high by 3 foot in diameter and 1 inch thick. And so we had machines to help me work on that. But it was big. Yes? Oh, how did, okay, so when I was younger, when I was 13, we moved to Lincoln, Nebraska, and I had lived in major cities before that. Um, so my mother thought I was going to run away, and she was probably right. And so she signed me up for all these different classes, and one of them happened to be a class with Lloyd Moore, and I really enjoyed it, and so I apprenticed with him through junior high and high school. I went on and got degrees in um, one in ceramics, and one in applied science, and one in scientific glass technology. So you can get degrees in this. You can even go further and get your PhD in it also. Any other questions? Yes? When do you like this? I don't know if I'm ever, okay, the question was, when is, when is, when do I know that this is what I want to do? I don't know if I've ever said that. Um, I keep thinking that I'm really young and I have lots of time, <laughs> but maybe I'm getting a little older and maybe I should think about that. But um, I just, it's an, it's an endless thing. And I think anything that you do is endless. Like if you go into painting, it's endless. If you go into ceramics, it's endless. It's, there's so much to do with just glass. Good.